Okay, video number two of Andrew Jackson and a couple other presidents. As last we left, Jackson was dealing with nullification crisis. He was dealing with various affairs. He was de dealing with etc., uh, etc., et bad tariffs, etc. So let, <laughs> let's add to this, shall we? So the removal of the Native Americans. And, okay, this is not just Jackson. Other presidents are be going to be involved in this. I mean, it goes all the way back to really Jefferson, maybe even Washington if you think about it, but Jefferson going to, is going to look at this issue as well. But Jackson is going to get the big, <laughs> the big uh, lump of this uh, assigned to him. The blame or the, the positive reviews, depending on which side you're on, but since we're here in Oklahoma, it's the blame. Okay, so the short version here is that the United States Congress, the United States government, makes treaties with Native American tribes. It says in Article 1, Section 8, that Congress has the ability to regulate commerce amongst, uh, let's see, with foreign nations and amongst the several states, comma, and with the uh, several, the Indian tribes. So the, the Native Americans are their own separate group of people. That's going to be important later, according to the Constitution. So the United States government is going to make treaties. So here's what's, here's what's going on in a lot of the, the minds of the, for lack of better words, the white people government. They're looking at the Native Americans as, hey, gold, God, and glory, right? Like the Spanish and the French. Spanish mostly, mostly, but gold, God, and glory. If we can get, if we can convert these Native Americans and civilize them, make them Christian, then it's all going to be good. Okay. Well, what if the Native Americans don't want to do that? Well, if they don't want to do that, then they need to go somewhere else. And so the U.S. government is going to start pushing them, pushing them west. Pushing them west. Now we could focus on sixteen thousand different tribes. There's not that many, but if we could, we, there's several hundred different tribes we could talk about. But um, really, the one that's going to make the biggest headlines for us are, is the Cherokees. And I'm not taking anything away from you know the Seminole or the Creek. Golly, their removals were awful, and lots of people died, and it's just terrible. Or the Chickasaws or the Choctaw. I mean, we could just go forever. But the reason that we talk about the Cherokees a lot in American history is because they left a paper trail. They went at it a little differently than some of the other Indian tribes. They, they tried to go through the process. And because we have a paper trail, we're able to, we, historians are able to talk a little bit more intelligently about how this works versus he said, she said, we have a paper trail with the Cherokees. All right, so what's going on here? Uh, the Cherokees uh, are going to Amongst the tribes, the Cherokees are going to be some of the leaders who part of the Cherokee Nation wants to integrate into the American system. And so wants to uh, learn English, wants to understand uh, Christianity, wants to assimilate into the white schools. Part of the Cherokee tribe does that. And so... They have a written constitution. They have their own written language, you know, Sequoia and the, and the gang. So they're a little different. Here's the problem. In 1828, Georgia is going to make a deal with the federal government. The deal that Georgia makes is, hey, we really want the Native Americans out. We want to push them to the west because uh, we found some gold on the land that we weren't expecting and, and other reasons, but we're going to kick them out. The federal government says, ah, we'd like to help you out, but Georgia, you're so big. And Georgia says, tell you what, we will give up our claim to West Georgia. Today we call that Mississippi and Alabama. We'll give up our claim to West Georgia if you will help us get rid of the Native Americans. And the federal government agreed to that deal. All right. In the Cherokee, in the Native American land, in the Cherokee lands, um, there's going to be a situation in Georgia where Georgia is going to, Georgia, the state of Georgia is going to pass a law. And in that law, it says that uh, Christian missionaries are going to be allowed to come into the Cherokee territory and do their thing. Even if the Cherokees disagree with that, because it's a Georgia law and the Cherokee nation, their territory is inside the state of Georgia. Georgia 
believes that they have the ability to override any of the Cherokees' um, vociferous different opinion. Well, the Cherokees are going to sue uh, Georgia. And so the case is Wor Worcester versus Georgia. And so um, this is a basically a missionary, a Christian missionary, who comes in. He says, you can't kick me out. Cherokees because the Georgia has given me the ability to come in and Georgia is the state that you guys all live in So the Cherokees took him to court. They went all the way to the Supreme Court and here we have yes, that's right John Marshall and this is one of his last cases. This is the last case that we're going to be talking about that deals with John Marshall remember that John Marshall is a Federalist he is all about giving the national government more power than the states. Okay, so how is he going to rule? Well, now that you remember that, you know how he's going to rule. He's going to say, hey, Georgia, I was looking at the Constitution here, and the Constitution says that the National Congress has the ability to make, uh, to talk about commerce and or make treaties with the Native Americans. It doesn't say anything about Georgia having the ability to do that, and therefore, um, the Georgia law conflicts with the national, with the Constitution, therefore, Georgia, you can't do that. So, Georgia, uh, your law is going to be struck down. Now, interestingly enough, uh, Jackson, who is not a, <laughs> Jackson's not a big fan of John Marshall, Jackson uh, retort. Jackson obviously was pro Georgia at this point. He was hoping, hoping to be able to remove the Cherokees the nice way, and uh, Marshall uh, Marshall gets his Supreme Court to vote for the Cherokees. And Jackson's response to this is: John Marshall has made him. I'll say that again. John Marshall has made his decision. Now let's see him enforce it. That's a big deal, guys. That's a big deal. The Supreme Court has made a decision, John Marshall, has made a decision. Now let's see him enforce it. Well, how does that work? Supreme Court makes a, makes a decision about a, a law, whether it's constitutional or unconstitutional, abortion, gay rights, whatever it is, gun control, whatever it is, flag burning, whatever it is. If somebody then comes back behind and does something opposite of the law, well, what can the Supreme Court do about it? The answer is nothing. It's not the Supreme Court's job to enforce the law. Whose job is it to enforce the law? Well, let's see, is it Congress? No, Congress's job to, is to create law. Now, Congress can make the penalty for breaking the law, they can say, here's the law, if you break the law, here's your prison sentence. But can Congress actually go out and enforce the law? No. So not the judiciary, not the legislative. So who are we left with? It's the executive power. The executive, which is the nice big word for what president of the United States, and La la la, give me a second. <laughs> That's what I get for standing there on one slide the entire time and not knowing my password. That's not awkward at all. So, there we go. Back to reality. So, the executive power is the power that enforces the Supreme Court uh, decisions. The executive is the president. Okay, now look at that sentence again. Hey, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let's see him enforce it. So what is Jackson actually saying here? He says, huh, okay. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to do what you say. So again, here's Jackson <sighs> causing controversy again. All right. <laughs> uh, click, click. What's going on here? What is going on? Oh, I had to be on the thing with the thing. There we go. Gotta love technology. They're all alone here in room eight. 
staring at the walls all day. Good times. Hey, speaking of good times, the drug. <laughs> Terrible segue. I'd like to apologize. Speaking of good times, <laughs> trail cheers. So um, we're going to have lots of lots of uh, Indian removal treaties. We're going to start. Well, in 1830, uh, Congress is going to pass the Indian Removal Act that basically says we're going to take all the Native Americans, we're going to push them uh, to the other side of the Mississippi River. In fact, we're going to set up a territory. And to put them all in, and they will all live nice, happy lives afterwards because the government, once they've set up this Native American territory, then um, the, whites, the white government will never mess with the Indians ever again. Okay, so we have lots of treaties. The Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek, the Treaty of Dokesville, the Treaty of New Ashota, the Treaty of... The Treaty of I mean, we're talking about hundreds of Native American tribes, right? But again, let's focus on the Cherokees again because they had a paper trail. They they went through the Supreme Court process and, gosh, tried to get legislation passed. You know, what's interesting about this is that uh, the Cherokees, and I don't want to spend a lot of time with too much of this, but the Cherokees, we had the, the, the uh, mixed-blood Cherokees and the full-blood Cherokees. And the full-blood Cherokees, they signed a treaty uh, with the government, and they came over to Oklahoma. The mixed bloods, uh, led by Principal Chief John Ross, decided to stay and fight and fight, not like, but to fight it out in the legal system. Uh, at one point, Andrew Jackson writes a letter to one of his friends, and he says that Principal Chief John Ross is an ignort savage. Let me spell that for you: I K N O R T. Ignort. Principal Chief John Ross is an ignorant savage. Please note that Principal Chief John Ross graduated from Princeton, and the President of the United States, who's calling a graduate from Princeton ignorant, graduated from eighth grade. <laughs> Irony. Good times. Anyway, so Jackson is going to have uh, specifically, I mean, you know, here in Oklahoma, we talk about the five civilized tribes coming over here. And then ultimately, the Cherokees are going to go all the way up to the very end. They are going to be forcibly relocated. Uh, not that the Creeks and the Seminoles weren't, because they were as well, but the Cherokees, uh, they're going to come across and it's going to be well documented. And they're going to, uh, what is it, 100,000 Indians ultimately are going to be kicked out. And the Trail of Tears, which actually happens during the next president's term, Martin Van Buren, although Jackson gets the credit for doing this terrible stuff, uh, Martin Van Buren, the Trail of Tears, uh, 1838, 14, uh, let's see, Van Buren sends U.S. military to forcibly remove r remaining Indians. 3,000 of the 14,000 Indians died just on the trip over here. We talk about you know the, all, all the Native American folklore and stuff like that. The the uh, the rose rocks that we have here in Oklahoma uh, are the are the tears from the Indians uh, or the blood from the Indians as they as they as they scrape their feet across the ground. The tears falling from their eyes uh, form these these rose rocks. And as you may know, the rose rocks are only found in like two places in the world. One is Oklahoma, and the other place is some some little place up in Sweden or something like that. But anyway, so the Barite Rose. Um, not everybody is pro-Indian removal. There are groups of, uh, let's see, the Lady Circular, Catherine Beecher and Lydia Sigourney, and we're going to be talking about them later, encouraged women to oppose the removal of Indians. So there were groups out there that were anti-Indian removal, but once Andrew Jackson makes his decision, hey, speaking of crazy decisions, new topic, new topic, Yes, there's even more on Andrew Jackson, the bank issue. As you may recall, Alexander Hamilton said, you got to have a bank, even though it's not in the Constitution, because you got to have something. Uh, if Congress has the ability to, to, uh, to print money, and it has the ability to regulate interstate commerce, and it has the ability to blah, 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 then you got to have a bank. And remember, Thomas Jefferson said, uh, no, you can't have a bank because the word bank is not in the Constitution. Strict construction, loose construction. We've talked about that. Good. So here's Andrew Jackson's uh, version of it. The bank charter, 
which is up every 10 years. George Washington, remember, he started it, and then or 20 years, I'm sorry, every 20 years. And so then he then he sent the first the first wave out there. It was re upped, and now it's coming up for its its second re upping, its third charter. Uh, in 1836. Well, Jackson's was elected in 1828. He's going to be re-elected in 1832. So the bank issue is going to be during his tenure. Now, Jackson's not a big fan of the bank. In fact, he hates, he hates the Bank of the United States, the National Bank. Because he looks at it and he says, hey, I, I've been looking at, you know, the numbers and the ledgers, the, the ledgers and the, 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 the black and the red and seeing, seeing what's going on. And uh, although he hardly even graduated from high school, not that I'm taking poor shots at this guy. He's been dead for 200 years. <laughs> He's been dead. Um, so he takes the bank and he, he says, I've been looking at this and a lot of rich people are getting richer off of this bank. The bank is only loaning money to the people who already don't need money and the poor people are suffering and remember Jackson believes that he is the common man and so he decides that uh, he's going to start taking shots at the bank. Um, so Henry Clay, the great compromiser, Henry Clay and uh, Daniel Webster, huh, Webster, I wonder if he knew, knew any words. Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, they're going to, uh, <laughs> I cracked myself up, they're going to come up with this brilliantly evil plan. They're going to say, hey, to the bank president, Nicholas Biddle, they're going to say, hey, Biddle, do this. Why don't you ask Congress to re-up re -up the charter in 1932, which is earlier than what was necessary. And so, 1832, what is it? In 1830, I thought I was weird in my head. In 1832, why don't you ask Congress to re-up it early? Now, here's the trick. If Jackson vetoes the charter, then all the people in the North who are getting rich off the, off the bank, they're going to say, well, we're not going to, we're not going to like you. We're not going to re-elect um, uh, people. We're not going to re-elect Jackson. We're not going to re-elect any of his buddies. And then if he does if he does allow the bank to be re-upped, because what happens obviously is that Congress has to pass it and then the president, the president signs it off. He could veto if he wants. And so, but if he doesn't veto, if he allows it to go through, then all the common people, who Jackson believes he's one of the common people, all the common people will then say, oh, Jackson, you said you were one of us, but you're really a loser. And so, they're, excuse me, they're gonna try to trap Jackson. And sure enough, it goes through and Jackson doesn't even he just signs it on the veto power. He, he, he knocks it out. So he doesn't re-up the charter of the bank. Oh, it's, it's going to get crazy here in a second. He doesn't re-up it. But the re-up is 1832. The National Bank is still chartered through 1836. They just tried to charter re-up the charter early, but the charter still goes through 36. All right. So what's going to happen? Let me tell you what happens. We've got, a, we've got an election, right, that's, that happens in 1832, which is one of the reasons people were trying to get the bank saying so that, right. So, again, with Jackson, you either like him or you think he's a, not a nice person. I wonder if you can tell which way I, I lean. Anyway, Jackson says, or so Jackson, uh, over here, a very famous political cartoon, this is Jackson uh, King Andrew the first that hit, obviously drawn by his political opponents and he's standing there on the Constitution crushing etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and he's got in his hands he's got a veto Jackson used the veto more uh, more than all the other the first six presidents combined he used the veto a lot and in fact uh, historians look at look back and say he vetoed pieces of legislation simply because one, he just didn't personally like it, whether it was constitutional or not. He just didn't like it. Or two, maybe he didn't even like the person who wrote it, and he just vetoed it because, you know, he had a personal grudge about somebody. Huh. Picky eating affair, right? So in the election of 1832, there, there was another group of people that showed up 
uh, who are going to push, uh, push for a change or push for a new political party. The Anti-Masonic League. So the Anti-Masonic League is, let's see, the first third party in American presidential politics, single issue party that opposed Freemasonry. All right, so Freemasonry, we're not going to get into a lot of that, but Freemasonry is a society uh, that, uh, <laughs> I don't even know how I would describe the Freemasons. Anyway, it's a group of people that have been around for a long, long time, and uh, feel free to Wikipedia Freemasonry. Uh, yeah, George Washington was a Freemason, Benjamin Franklin was a Freemason. Anyway, but the point is that Andrew Jackson was a Freemason, or was a Mason. I guess Mason was a Freemason. Um, and this group of people believe that the Freemason were actually part of, I mean, the argument is they're part of the Illuminati, and that they, they know the secrets of the secrets, and they were, they were part of the, the Holy Crusades and the, the Chalice. And Okay, again, feel free to, you know, look, look that stuff up. But this is the anti-Masonic party, and so specifically targeting anti-Jackson. And we're going to have a lot of people jump on the bandwagon here. Henry Clay is going to jump on here, um, and uh, that's the next slide. In the nominating convention, in the nominating convention, we have uh, uh, so this is a new a new thing. The Jacksonian Democrats, that's what we're going to call them now. The Jacksonian Democrats, they're going to have their own uh, nomination convention, and so Jackson's going to obviously be chosen, and then he's going to have a running mate, uh, Martin Van Buren, who's going to become vice president. The other groups are going to have theirs as well, and then we're going to have the election of 1832, and Jackson just cleans the clock with everybody. Um, all right, back to the bank issue. <laughs> Jackson says, hey, you know, I've got to, I've got to, I, I don't like the bank. I've still got it for four more years because of the charter. But that doesn't mean that the bank actually actually has to have any money. Because if I take the money away from the bank, what are they going to do? So that's what he did. <laughs> Andrew Jackson got a bunch of his buddies who owned banks. Uh, they were state-run banks. So not national, but state-run banks. And he told uh, Nichols Biddle, the president of the National Bank, hey, I'm going to need you to start moving funds out of the National Bank and into the smaller banks, into the state banks. Uh, today, uh, we call them the pet banks. They were the pets of Andrew Jackson. So the pet banks, and then, and of course, Nicholas Biddle was like, wait, if you take all of our money, uh, we, then what are we here for? And Jackson's like, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of the point, dude. So he's trying to hamstring the National Bank, and it looks like it's going to work here. The pet banks uh, start to get an increase of money, and things are going well for Jackson uh, on this particular issue. Well, until, gosh, now there's going to be a problem, because if the National Bank doesn't have any money, how does the National Bank pay off the debts? Hmm, that is a problem. If the national banks, if the national bank can't pull, uh, can't pay off any debts, then they have to push the debts onto the states. Well, the states don't want the debts, so the states, where do they push the debt off to? Oh, well, the states push the debt off to the people by calling in loans. When you call in loans that people are not ready to pay for, that causes a panic. Oh, we're going to have another panic. There you go. Panic of 1837. All right. Fantastic. Political cartoon. Uh, here's that's Jackson. That's his face on the body of a donkey. And he's got his little pet banks, his little chickens right there, and various people, Martin Van Buren, various things represent foxes and things like that. But why this is important for us, this particular political cartoon, is interesting to me because here we are, uh, here currently in the year 2020, we have. In the United States of America, we have two major political parties. We have the Republicans and the Democrats. Um, and they're represented. Uh, we have the red states and the blue states, right? The red and the blue. The Republicans are red. The Democrats are blue. And if we look at political cartoons, um, that there are animals that are represented, that represent the, the different uh, the parties. So, like, you know, for the United States of America, we are the eagle, right? And Russia is the bear, and China is the dragon. The Republican Party and the Democratic Party, they have their animals. 
and you already know what they are, but here you go. So, so you ready? Jackson, jackass, donkey, right? Jackson the jackass, donkey. Jackson, his political party, the Jacksonian Democrats. I'm not even making this up, guys. I can't, I can't even make this stuff up. The Jacksonian Democrats, represented by the first Democrat president, Jackson the jackass, the donkey. And today, in the year 2020, the Democrats, what is their political cartoon figure animal representative? The Democrats represented by the donkey. Can't even make that up. You're about to ask, wait, if the Democrats are the donkey, and now we know why they're the donkey, how did they, the Republicans become the elephants? Oh, that's a good question. I'll answer it in 60 some odd historical years. The president, uh, okay, so the pet banks. Uh, now that the National Bank is basically out of the picture for a while, the uh, then we have other banks that are just going to start popping up everywhere because people are running out of money and they've got to pay off the state banks. So other banks are going to start popping up. We call these the wildcat banks. Well, wildcat banks are bad because wildcat banks start printing their own money. Uh, awkward. And so people go to the wildcat banks to get paper money that's printed by these banks. And then they try to, to pay off the other banks who may or may not accept the printed money from this random bank out of the, you know, the, the backyard of some local beer grower. I mean, just crazy stuff that people are doing. And so then the government uh, issues the specie circular. So you remember that uh, specie is an actual coin, like in your hand, hold onto a coin, gold or silver. And the national government says, new rule, new rule, you cannot buy land with paper money anymore. You have to use gold and silver. You have to use gold and silver, like physical coins, to do this. And if not, you can't do it. So all these wildcat banks that are printing paper money and all the state banks that have their own state paper money, they're, now they're all scrambling. They're scrambling, scrambling for coins. Again, and we've talked about this, there's only, only so many coins that go around. And again, this is going to be a panic. All right. Yeah, I covered that well. Good job. Boo! <laughs> Roger Tawney. Boo! You'll see. Roger Tawney is, uh, is appointed by President Jackson onto the Supreme Court. He's going to become the new Chief Justice because, sad, John Marshall has now passed away. So Roger Tawney gets onto the court, and we have the Tawney Court. The Tawney Court is known for a couple of things. They're known for some. They're known for some interesting court cases, and they're known for yes, that's right, the worst Supreme Court, the most hated Supreme Court case of all time, which we'll get to in about I don't know five, six, seven videos. Roger Tawney. There you go. Look at this guy. Um, I wonder if you can guess what. The, I wonder if you can guess what the. Uh, what uh, the court case would be about, let's see, somewhere in the 50s, I wonder if it had to do with slavery. Oh, you're right, it is, so there you go. Okay, okay, get, moving on, I gotta do these, these cases. So here are a couple cases that came out of the early Tawny Court. We had the Charles River Bridge uh, case, and so this is the case that says, hey, if it is a, if it is a, well, what do they call this, the legislative charter, um, then that doesn't necessarily mean you can't do something. So this is a very loose construction, uh, and so this is going to uh, start eroding away Dartmouth College, which is the one that said if it's a uh, if it's a contract, it's a contract, and so this is going to start eating away on some of this stuff. But there's some other other court cases. Here we have New York, uh, the mayor of New York versus Millen in '37. Uh, we've got immigrants coming over, and so the uh, the mayor of New York said we got immigrants coming over from Europe that are, as they're getting off the boat, they're like, <coughs> you know, tuberculosis and stuff. And we, you know, we have to be able to stop this. And so the detractors said, well, New York, you can't, you can't stop people from coming in 
because that's commerce, and if, if you know, commerce between countries in the United States, that's only controlled by the national government. Therefore, uh, New York, you can't say, you can't say anything about that. And Roger Taney says, well, in this case, the, govern the governor of New York can because obviously we're talking about the health of people, and so uh, New York is allowed to use their police action, what is it, the police power, their police power, which means to uh, remove people, their police power to enforce health and safety laws. Okay. And the last one is Briscoe versus the Bank of Kentucky, and again in 37, allowed the bank, now look at that, allows the bank owned by a state to issue currency despite constitutional uh, prohibition. So the state is going to start making its own money. Uh, no, you can't do that. The Constitution says illegal. McCall versus Maryland is a national government, a state government, the national government went, come on now. And Tawny said, eh, it's okay. Tawny. Election of 1828. So Jackson serves two times. He says, well, I could go again, but you know what? George Washington only served twice, so instead I'm going to let somebody else do it. Now here's what really happened. This is old Martin Van Buren right there. Martin Van Buren right there. And, and he is, if you've been paying attention to the past two videos, he is in Jackson's pocket this entire time. And so everybody knows that if you vote for Van Buren, then uh, Van Buren will move into the White House and Jackson will just basically move next door into the little cottage and uh, say, hey, Van Buren, by the way, this is what you think today. So, you know, it's basically voting for uh, Jackson again. But uh, Van Buren's gonna, gonna run for president. Now, the Another uh, uh, political party is going to form, the Whigs. Eh, right there, look at me. Got it. The Whigs. The Whigs are going to be <laughs> anti-Jackson. So the Whigs, let's see, uh, took the name from the anti-monarch. So yeah, right, right, the Tories and the Whigs um, over there in England. The Tories were the pro-king and the Whigs were the anti-king. And so here we have a political party called the Whigs because they're making the point that Jackson is Emperor King Andrew, and we hate him, and so the Whig Party. Uh, they're going to uh, they're going to have a lot of people involved in this, and so we've got Clay, we've got uh, uh, Calhoun, <laughs> we've got we've got a lot of people who don't agree with anything except that they hate Jackson. So there you go. Now, what's interesting about this particular election is that the the uh, some of the uh, people in the Whig Party they came up with an interesting uh, interesting strategy, an interesting strategy to beat Jackson in the election. So they learned from the from the John Quincy Adams election that if you don't if you have too many people running for president, then you don't then somebody doesn't get enough votes, then it goes into the House and the Whigs are counting they're counting their votes and they're like, I think we have more people in the House than everybody else. And so if we can split the vote and get the vote to go into the House, then we can win the presidency and take it away from Van Buren. And that, that was the strategy. And I think that was a good strategy for the Whigs. But they, and so they ran three people. They ran, let's see, Harrison and some other guys. <laughs> Harrison, oh, William Henry Harrison, Daniel Webster, and Hugh Lawson. And sure enough, had the vote gone the way the Whigs thought it would go, then one of those guys would be president now. But, well, actually one of them is going to be president, but later. Um, Van, but Van Buren actually, again, because he's riding the coattails of Jackson, he's very popular in the West. He's, he's very popular, and so he's going to get all the votes. And you see, uh, Van Buren's going to win the electoral vote by 58%, and so he has enough. So they don't have to have a runoff in the House, and Van Buren becomes president. And he's number eight. Oh, look at him there with his big old sideburn. I feel like my hair's... You know, no, no, I'm standing next to him. I feel like my hair is nice and neat. Okay, let's see. So Van Duren is basically, again, a Jackson puppet. <laughs> uh, his presidency did not go as smooth. <laughs> I was going to say, it did not go as smooth as Jackson's. Jackson, nullification, tariff, abomination, the Peggy Eaton, and the Indians, and the bank. Jackson, uh, uh, Martin Van Duren may have gone worse. Uh, rebellion in Canada, growing abolitionists. There's a vocabulary word for the day, abolitionist, somebody who's anti-slavery. 
annexation of Texas and economic depression. So, okay, so here we, uh, Van Buren shows up and the panic is going to start with regard to all the bank issues that Jackson caused. So uh, the panic starts, and we've already talked about how panics work or don't work, as the case may be, and it's going to cause everybody to, <laughs> I was about to say to panic, but I'm going to go with panic. Look, I know we got to do it. we got to talk about Texas. <coughs> we got to talk about Texas, but it's going to be fine. I'm going to get through it. I'm going to be fine. All right, so look, Texas is part of, uh, was part, in, in, on this side, Texas is part of Mexico. Mexico um, is, uh, and Texas is very sparsely populated uh, versus, or compared to uh, Mexico proper. Uh, so I was, I was gonna say South Mexico, but it would be like regular Mexico. Uh, so Texas is North Mexico, and it's very sparsely populated. So Mexico, the Mexican government basically says to the white, uh, settlers, hey, come on over, come on over to Texas, and you know, or yeah, come to come to Spanish Texas, and if you come to Spanish Texas or Mexican Texas, the case may be, if you come to be Mexica, Texas, okay, uh, if you come to Mexican Texas, then and you farm the, you know, you farm the fields and all that stuff, and then that's that's good for Mexico. However. If you are a white settler, an American white settler, and you want to come into Texas, then you have to do a couple things. One, you've got to uh, you've got to convert to Catholic. Two, you've got to learn how to speak Spanish. And three, uh, there are no slaves in Mexico. So, if you come, then there you go. Well, uh, there you go. In 1830, let's see, in 1821, Stephen Austin, Austin, Stephen Austin establishes a settlement in Texas. And in 1823, uh, Mexico gives uh, land grants to settlers. So everything's working out in Mexico's point of view here. In 1830, the Anglo-Americans, we're talking about the whites, are uh, coming in. They outnumber the Mexican Texans six to one. Six to one. And the American Texans, uh, they, they are more American than they are Mexican. And they... They're not going to convert. They're not going to convert to Catholic. They're not going to convert to non-slavery. They're not going to. Con they're not going to sp speak Spanish. They're going to speak English. So this is not working out for Mexico. All right. Actions of Mexican government opposed by Anglo Americans include the abolition of slavery, Indian American settlements in 1830. In 1830, also Mexico raised uh, taxes on American goods, a, a big tariff, and in 1834. I'm sorry, 1835, Santa Ana, so General Santa Ana, is going to be sent to quell some of these uh, Americans who are causing some problems. And so he's going to start using military um, stuffs, which I don't know if you've been paying attention in American history. If you start threatening, you start threatening Americans with, you better do this or else, Americans tend to go, okay, we'll choose the or else. That's just what we do. So, October of 1835, Mexican troops uh, go into Gonzales, Texas to, to uh, kind of drop the hammer on some Americans who are not following the rules uh, because the Americans have a couple of cannon. <laughs> Illegal, we can't have them. cannon. Uh, and they're going to have their cannon. And we, it turns into a Lexington Concord issue. The, the Mexican authorities come in. And we have the flag here of the Gonzalan Tex, American Texans uh, from Gonzales. And you see it's the one star. Oh, look, it's lonely. It's like the lone star and the cannon. And it says there, come and take it. Anybody get the reference? Anybody get the reference? Anybody get the reference? Come and take it. Anybody get the reference? I'll be curious. Somebody email me the reference. See if it, somebody email me the reference. Because, uh, I mean, that person who did that flag, they listen to their AP World History teacher. All right. You remember this? The Alamo? <laughs> That's fine. Let's do it. Okay, moving on. March 6, 1836. So there's a group of 100, uh, 100 Americans who were causing issues intentionally, and Santa Ana was, was told to go handle that situation. 
So over a period of a week or two, uh, the Americans and a much larger force of, of Mexicans, they fought several skirmishes. The Americans realized that uh, they're being outnumbered, and so they decided to go to, today we call it San Antonio, and they go to this mission. So a mission is like a, like a church kind of thing, so like a church. Uh, uh, so this uh, a church that has walls, uh, big walls, like a fort. So it's like a fort church, a church fort. Okay, anyway, the point is they show up. And this is not a small place. Today you can go see the Alamo down there on the river, river walk. Um, and it doesn't look so big when you're right there. But in its original heyday, oh, there's, a, there's a reconstruction. The walls which surround it uh, are 400 meters long. So that's like four football fields, like the end to the end all the way, uh, 400 meters and so that's four football fields. The walls were between nine and 12 feet tall and they were two and three quarters feet thick, so almost three feet thick. So big place to defend. Uh, ultimately there's going to be 183, 183 uh, Americans who are going to hold themselves up in inside the Alamo. Now the stories talk about how um, the uh, uh, Santa Ana had sent a, a a letter to President Jackson early on and said, "Hey, um, we're not playing here. You need to get rid of your Americans. We're, we're sick of the Americans in Texas. We need you, you. They're not playing by the rules." And Jackson, of course, ignores everything. But uh, Santa Ana says, "If here's the here's how it's going, we're going to play it. We're not going to take prisoners. We're not taking prisoners. So if we find an American, uh, we're going to kill them." We're not taking prisoners. And in fact, the morning of March 6th, when the 1500, which is going to grow to 1800, which is going to grow to 2100, Mexican troops with cannon uh, show up. Uh, they are going to raise a red flag, just a solid red flag, which tells all the Americans inside the Alamo, um, you better win this one because if you lose it, they're not taking prisoners. So the red flag means no prisoners. Now you know something. Well, there you go. <laughs> That's uh, the Alamonians, I, th I think I made up a word. The Alamo defenders, they did, they hung out for 13 days. They, they staved off the Mexicans for 13 days. Uh, however, it was not meant to be. They're, they're going to run short of ammo. We, we've, we've heard this story before. And there's just so many of the Mexican army, and there are so many places they can get up over the walls with ladders that eventually the Mexicans just overwhelm the, uh, the guys in the Alamo. Now, uh, famous people who died in the Alamo include uh, Jim Bowie, the guy who, his last name is the Bowie Knife, and then we have, or the Bowie Knife, depends on how you pronounce that, and then Davy Crockett would be the other famous one uh, that, you know, we, Davy, Davy Crockett. Well, probably none of you have seen that video. We saw that back in third grade at John Glenn Elementary, and we were like, yeah, USA, USA. But anyway, the point is, that a couple of uh, folk heroes died in the Alamo. Uh, there were women and children there, and the Mexicans did spare their lives because, well, women and children, and you know the rules of war. You don't, uh, but so, <laughs> gosh, so many great stories. But this is not military history, so I'm going to move on. So the Alamo, rem remember the Alamo, and here's why we say that: because it, th when the story got out. And the Americans found out about that. They're like, oh, oh, Mexico wants to, oh, somebody give me a gun. I'm going to go. That's exactly what happened. The, it was a fearic victory. Oh, we know that word too the, from uh, uh, AP World. A fearic victory. The Mexicans won the, won the battle, but their winning was, is going to cause them to lose the war. The Battle of Goliad. The Santa Ana defeats the Texans at Goliad on March 27th, and Santa Ana executes everybody. Again, a fearic victory, because that's going to get out, the newspaper's going to get it, and even the people in New York are like, whoa, whoa, what is he doing down there? He's killing Americans? Oh, we're going to handle him. The Battle of San Jacinto, San Jacinto, April 21st to 36th, Sam Houston. Oh, look at that, Houston. Sam Houston attacks and defeats Santa Ana to win independence. And basically they draw a line at the Rio Grande. That's going to be an issue later. The Rio Grande. Hey, I spelled great. 
the Rio Grande as, uh, as the border, and then uh, Santa Ana later declares that whole thing illegal. So, why is this important for American history? <coughs> Texas. The Lone Star State. Hey, you know, the one star? I get it. Okay. The Lone Star State. So Texas, and that's, that's its weird uh, original shape there. It's got the panhandle kind of crooks up all the way up there through Colorado and Utah, all that kind of crazy stuff. Um, uh, a lot of people in Texas are like, okay, now that we are free, that we are our own Lone Star Republic, their own government, their own country, Texas is its own country. Should stay that way. Uh, Texas uh, is. Uh, some of the people in Texas are saying, "Hey, we should become a state of the United States." One, because they're so cool, and two, um, we have to bring at least one terrible football team into the Big Twelve Conference. And three, I'm joking. They brought like three bad teams. Uh, uh, and uh, there you go. But the problem is here is that we have uh, Texas is where, located where it's located south of the Missouri Compromise line, which means the Missouri Compromise says anything south of the 30, of the 30, of, the, of that line is a slave state. Well, Texas, a lot of cotton. Mexico said there were no slaves. Yeah, that's a whole kettle of worms. Do we want to open that? Well, well at some point we are going to do that. Also, just for fun, the land, let's just say, let's just say uh, the land in uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. Well, I mean, originally it was Native American territory, but if we talk about the, the conquering, the conquering uh, European groups, uh, originally it was Spanish, so you have the Spanish flag, the Spanish flag. And then it was taken over when Spain lost to France in the War of uh, So that's the French flag. And then Mexico declared its independence, right? And so now it's the Mexican flag. So Dallas Fort Worth was Mex under Mexico. And then, where am I going? And then it's the Republic of the Republic of Texas. So that's their flag. And they were a republic for nine years. And then we have the state of Texas flag, the Lone Star State right there, the state of uh, the state of Texas when we incorporated them in 1845, and then we had the United States flag there, and so Dallas Fort Worth has been under six flags. That's right, Dallas Fort Worth has been under the six flags of Texas. Moving on. <laughs> Some of you are like, why did he why did he blink so slowly? And others are like, I get it. And others are like. Wait, what? There was something in there? And then you rewind it and you're like, no, I don't know what's going on. Texas. Just remember that they have terrible football teams. Moving on. Election of 1840. So Martin Van Buren, again, he's going to be nominated by the Democrats. Uh, but this time the Whigs, the Whigs are, are uh, they're starting to figure it out. They're like, no, let's just do this. Let's just put one guy out there, make him very popular. And then people will vote for the Whigs, and then the Democrats will die off. Part of that happened. William Henry Harrison, so General Harrison, he's kind of an older dude, but he's a big, tall, strong guy. Uh, the uh, caricature of him, he's got the big axe, and he's walking around like Paul Bunyan, and, and he lives in the log cabin, and he, you know, he drinks hard whiskey, and oh, he's not, he should be president, kind of like Andrew Jackson, except he's on the opposing team now. And so they're going to push this guy. Plus, he's the hero of the general who beat Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa. Oh, I almost had it! Ah! And the prophet. Um, uh, I'm going to try that again. Tenskwat. Ta... Oh, shoot. Anyway, beat Tecumseh and then uh, uh, in the Battle of Tippecanoe. So then William Henry Harrison. His vice presidential pick to run on the same ticket, the Whig ticket, is Tyler, John Tyler. So we have the little buttons people wear, the little bumper stickers they put on their cars. Not yet, there's no cars. Uh, that says, tip a canoe and Tyler too. It's kind of, a, it's very alliterative, right? Tip a canoe and Tyler too. So, uh, and sure enough, tip a canoe is going to win. Uh, so William Henry, William, William Henry Harrison wins the presidency. Martin Van Buren's out, Jackson is out, 
We've got a new sheriff coming into town. And the new sheriff, William Henry Harrison, he holds the record for, he has two presidential records. Presidential record number one is he has the longest inaugural speech. It was like two and a half hours that he read from a, from a paper. Oh, man, two and a half hours. That would be a killer. I mean, I'm almost like 45 minutes, and some of you, I mean, you, you're not even listening to me, and it's, and it's only been like 45 minutes. Two and a half hours of a president just droning on and on and on and on and on and on. Uh, I'm all by myself. I and, uh, 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 gosh, here's something you don't know about that speech, or you may know this, and it's just kind of interesting. Uh, it was rainy, and it was cold that day, because we were talking about March in uh, Washington, D.C., and it was cold and rainy and yucky, and, oh, man, the president who's standing out there without an umbrella, and he's reading a speech, and uh, he, gets, uh, he gets pneumonia. And he dies a month later. The President of the United States died uh, in a month. So he has two presidential records. One, he has the longest speech in the rain and the cold, causing him to get pneumonia. And then he dies in a month. And so his second, obviously, is that he's the shortest, the shortest, uh, uh, the shortest span. No, the shortest uh, uh, tenure. I'll go with that word. The shortest tenure of a president is as uh, it just one month. So the point is that John Tyler is now president, vice president. John Tyler is now president. Tyler, and uh, there you go. So what does that show? Well, it shows that a very popular person, uh, by the way, and the Whigs, they did not. They didn't even have a platform out there. A platform is where you take, uh, where you say, hey, if you vote for the Jacksonian Democrats, here's what you're voting for. You're voting for, we hate the bank, and you're voting for more tariffs, and you're voting for, and you're voting for a removal of the Indians, etc., etc. If you vote for the Whigs, then here's what you're voting for. Kind of like we do today with the Republicans and the Democrats. If you're pro-abortion and anti-gun, or you know, pro-flag burning, or pro-blah, blah, 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 blah well, then you're one way or the other, right? And, that's, and we know those platforms, on the, the planks on the platform. The Whigs, for this particular election, they didn't offer a platform. That's an interesting strategy. To not talk about what you believe and just try to win it on personality. Well, I wonder. Hey, uh, as of the filming of this video, we are two weeks away from the Biden... Uh, a Trump election. Interesting. If one or the other political party is choosing not to lay out the platforms of... Hmm. <laughs> this is why you pay attention to your American history teacher. You're welcome. The last slide for the day. Uh, just a general idea between the Republican... Uh, I'm sorry, the Democrats, the Jacksonian Democrats and the Whigs. And please do not, please do not, please do not say, oh, that's the Democrats versus the Republicans. These are not Republicans, like today's Republicans are not Republicans. Uh, the first Republican um, is going to be Abraham Lincoln, so that's not for another 30 years. So let's see, our slide says, Jacksonian Democrats, they focus on individual liberty, they challenge the privileged class, they favor states' rights, and limit the big government, federal government, and they tend to be popular with the lower classes and the working classes. The Whigs focused on community, uh, uh, let's see, favor national programs like tariffs, internal improvements, schools, support moral reforms like abolition and temperance. Temperance is another word for you. It means no alcohol. And then tend to be favored by the wealthy. All right, so there you go. There's Andrew Jackson and his ilk. I really should say Andrew Jackson and his, I'm going to say ilk and my personal views on Texas. All right, have a good day, and we'll see you on the flip side. Be good.